Hi, Andrea. How are you? Hi there. I'm doing good. I'm working on the audio. Um, Audience, audio sounds good. Um, it's pretty clear uh, here on my side. Can you say anything? Can you hear us? Yes. So yeah, yeah for some reason the headphones, yeah, they do not appear to be working, but the speaker uh, is still okay. Uh, let me share the screen and see if that is okay. Yeah, yeah, let's try it. I think I think you need to enable um, to enable it for me. It says also dis dis disabled uh, okay. participant screen sharing. I Gary, uh, could you enable the screen sharing? Um, cause I'm not, I'm not the host in the room meeting. Are you able to share? I think we again. need. Jerry is not, Jerry. She's online, I think. Um, let me just ping her. Hi, Xiao Chen. Seems to be working. Um, number two. Um, okay, seems to be working. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, let, let me know when uh, I should go ahead and start. Uh, um, if you want to wait a little bit more. Sure. Um, yeah, I think we can start. Um, the audience are coming into the Zoom meeting and, um, and I'll start uh, introducing you um, and the uh, discussion, Xiao Chen. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's uh, Applied Reinforcement Learning Seminar. Uh, so today, uh, we are really excited to have uh, Dr. Andrea Zanet. Um, and uh, the title of his talk is uh, Provable Benefits of uh, Actor Critic Methods for Offline Reinforcement Learning. And uh, towards the uh, later part of the talk, we will also have uh, our discussant uh, participating in the uh, discussion, uh, Dr. Xiaochen Tan. Uh, so I'll do the introduction first. Um, Dr. Andrea Zanet uh, is a postdoctoral scholar um, at the Department of Computer Science and uh, Electrical Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley, um, working primarily with Martin Wainwright, um, on the foundations of RL, um, a sub-area of AI that deals with decision-making under uncertainty. Um, Andrea uh, completed his PhD uh, in the uh, Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering at Stanford, advised by Professor Emma Brunskill uh, and Michael uh, J. Uh, Cochen Delfer. Um, during his candidacy, he also worked with uh, Alessandro uh, Vazaric from Facebook AI Research and Alec um, Agarwal from Microsoft Research. Um, his PhD dissertation proposed algorithms to tackle modern reinforcement learning challenges, um, such as exploration, uh, function approximation, adaptivity, and learning from offline data. Um, it was awarded the Jean Gallup Doctoral Dissertation Award um, before starting his PhD, Andrea was a master's student in the same department. Um, he has a background in mechanical engineering, um, worked in the uh, civil uh, construction sector and for M3, M3E, uh, developing high performance linear algebra software. 
He also spent uh, some time at the Von Karman Institute for Fluid Dynamics, which is a NATO affiliated international research establishment. Um, and um, Dr. Xiaochen Tan um, is a, a senior staff research scientist at DD Labs uh, and engineering manager in the uh, autonomous vehicle team, uh, working on core decision making problems in autonomous driving and ride hailing marketplace. Uh, since his graduate study, Dr. Tan has been uh, actively engaged in analyzing and designing practical intelligent algorithms at the intersection of machine learning, optimization, and most recently, uh, reinforcement learning and control. Um, his work on joint optimization of order dispatching and repositioning uh, via reinforcement learning uh, won the uh, BETS Demo Awards at NeurIPS 2018. He and his team uh, received the uh, Daniel H. Wagner Prize for Excellence in OR Practice at INFORMS 2019. Um, his work on AutoML in collaboration with UCLA won Outstanding Paper Awards at iClear 2021. Um, and um, welcome, um, Andrea and Xiaochen. So, Andrea, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I assume the audio is working and the screen is working too. Uh, this paper is going to be um, about uh, um, actor-critic methods for offline uh, uh, reinforcement learning. Um, I want to start with a single slide that is going to provide a very quick overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, we are going to talk about offline RL and we are going to focus on policy learning, which is the task of finding a near optimal policy. We will assume that we have a data set uh, that consists of state actions, uh, reward and, and successor states. And our job will be to design a batch reinforcement learning algorithm, which will output a policy. And we would hope that this policy be um, as good as possible. We will have a, um, we will evaluate the algorithm in a, in a risk adverse way, meaning that we will require that the algorithm outputs a policy, which is as good as possible on a very large event with very high probability. Um, I think the first step, the first uh, sort of takeaway um, from today's talk um, is going to be that um, if you want to design a risk adverse um, um, batch of enforcement learning algorithm, really you should think of it as being um, the solution of a certain mass mean problem where you're looking for uh, in, in, in a policy space and you're looking for the policy with a very high uh, predicted value function. Uh, but this value function should be sort of you know, adversarial in, in the face of uncertainty. And really actor critics um, is kind of a natural uh, algorithmic paradigm to take care of the max mean formulation because the actor is going to be connected to the solution of the max, whereas the critic will be um, try to will try to evaluate the policies uh, selected by the actor. Um, and in the end, we will derive uh, tight statistical uh, guarantees for a specific setting, which is um, the linear setting. The roadmap will be as follows. I'm going to do a very brief introduction about. Um, offline reinforcement learning, how it is, uh, you know, distinct from online RL. Um, I will then uh, chat about the maximum formulation and why I think this is sort of the right way to look at the problem. And then we will move to actor critic as a method to solve the maximum formulation. And finally, I will be presenting uh, the main result. Okay, so offline uh, reinforcement learning, first of all, what is this? Well, um, you, you know, there are sort of two macro paradigms in reinforcement learning. One is online RL and the other is uh, offline RL. And of course, this is not the only distinction that you can make, but it's kind of a significant one for, for this talk. In the online reinforcement learning setting, um, we are trying to very ambitiously, we are trying to converge to an optimal policy, an optimal controller. And what this means is that there is a reinforcement learning agent, which is in a certain state, and it is taking a certain action. And the um, environment will reveal a reward in, in that specific state and action, and it will um, lead the agent to transition to a successor state. 
this interaction continues and hopefully the agent is learning uh, what what is a good sequence of actions and it will hopefully converge to a very good uh, to, to a very good policy or a very good controller um, in contrast in offline reinforcement learning we assume that this interaction has already occurred so we already have a data set of state actions reward and success of state and um, we will design an algorithm that uses those data set, those data that are available to us without further interaction with the environment. And it will try to output a policy which is as good as possible. This is not the only goal that uh, we have in offline RL. Oftentimes we are interested with off policy valuation, but for this talk, uh, we really want to find a high performing policy using an offline data set. Now, when is this um, appropriate? Um, well, you know, there are several applications. Uh, um, uh, I understand that some people here are from the self-driving community. Uh, and so um, it would be like in their setting, it would be sort of um, not wise to ignore all the data that we have available from uh, human drivers, right? And if you want to really use those data, uh, we do need to implement some uh, form of offline reinforcement learning solution. And um, still remaining in, 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 the, in the sphere of self-driving, it's possibly not so wise to collect uh, uh, explorative data. It's not very uh, wise to uh, try to explore uncertain policies in, in the real environment. And also, batch reinforcement learning is really a key component of online of online RL. If you think about uh, some of the standard algorithms like uh, DQN, uh, implicitly they are using past experience to uh, try to change the controller, to try to improve the policy, and so they're really using past data to uh, perform a policy improvement step. Uh, and and so even for online reinforcement learning algorithm, really batch RL is kind of a fundamental fundamental tool. Now, what are the challenges? Well, there are several, as you can see from uh, the pictures over there. Uh, the, the output is not uh, generally a policy, as in, as in uh, sorry, the, the output uh, is not a prediction, uh, as it is in machine learning normally, uh, but rather it is a policy, which is like a sequence of action, a strategy that you should follow to achieve a certain goal. Um, we will be dealing for uh, we will be dealing with the sequential setting, and so errors can accumulate in in a very complex fashion, uh, much more than in bandits. We cannot collect more data in general, and at the end of the day, all this amounts to some uh, form of counterfactual reasoning. What if I take a certain action uh, instead of the one that uh, is present in my data set? And all these will be coupled with. Uh, uh, large technological spaces that are common in uh, um, in reinforcement learning applications. Now, this is sort of uh, an overall introduction of why we care about offline RL. Um, and um, let's try to move now to uh, the specific setting and, and the specific goal that we want to achieve. Um, uh, the setting is the following. Let's say we have a data set, and the data set uh, contains state actions, reward, and, and successor states. I think I'm using a fairly standard uh, um, terminology and, and symbols, hopefully. Um, we will place very few restrictions in the way uh, all this is generated. So in particular, uh, we will ask that the reward does come from the actual reward function uh, of the uh, macro decision process. And likewise, we would hope that the successor state does come from uh, um, the underlying MDP. But other than that, uh, uh, really, the procedure that generates the state in action that we are seeing is not really, it doesn't need to be stationary. So it could be that this is generated by some controller that is evolving with time. And this is a, a standard, a rather standard case. Um, our data set doesn't come from um, stationary distributions often time, but really it comes from whatever policy we've been deploying so far. And those policies, they might be adaptive to the data that are uh, being experienced. And, and that's totally fine. 
So, um, uh, you know, we place very few restrictions um, on the data set. Now, um, our goal is to design, uh, um, uh, let me make sure, are you still seeing the screen? Is it still moving? I seem to be having a little issue here. Yeah. Um, it looks fine. It looks fine here. So, so are you reading like batch algorithm in in the lower part? Yeah, yeah. In okay. The, in the central yeah. lower part of the screen. Okay, okay. So this is a uh, it's a glitch on my external display. No problem. Okay, thank you. So, um, our goal here is to ingest the data set and uh, work in a very high probability event. So we will tolerate some small arbitrary. Uh, failure possibility uh, for our algorithm. And what the algorithm is going to do is going to use uh, a certain function class, uh, a certain predictor class, and a certain um, uh, and a certain policy class, and it will produce a near optimal policy. Now, our goal is really risk adverse. How do we evaluate the algorithm? Well, what we don't want is the following. We don't want the algorithm to return a policy that might be perhaps very good, it might even be good in expectation, but in some other cases is really, really bad. Perhaps, you know, if we change the data set just a tiny bit, we don't want the algorithm to return a policy that is completely different and, and um, you know, performs really, really poorly. So we want to be a bit risk adverse and we want some guarantees from the algorithm. And in particular, sure, we want a policy that performs um, as high as possible, but this performance should be guaranteed with very high probability on a very large event. Meaning that if I want to go ahead and deploy this policy, I will have the guarantee that this policy performs as advertised. Now, let me try to make a simple um, uh, example. Uh, and this simple example, uh, I think it will sort of um, explain the basic mechanics of the algorithm. And um, so this idea of returning a, a good risk adverse policy is really something that you can appreciate if you just have a single state and two actions, action A and action B. What we want to do is to return the action that yields the highest reward. What's the naive solution to this problem? Well, I have some data set and I use my data set and I will compute maximum likelihood uh, for action A and action B for the reward function. And I'm going to return the, the highest one. So in this case, I'm going to return action A because it has uh, a higher empirical uh, value for the reward. Now, this may work if your data set plays action A and action B in, in a sort of an equal way. But you may imagine that this idea of doing maximum likelihood is and, and taking the highest um, empirical average is very bad if you only have one sample in, in action A. Because in that case, the empirical average has basically very little connection with, uh, with the actual empirical mean of the reward. So a better approach is to try to construct confidence intervals on action A and confidence intervals on action B, and then use that information. So remember, our goal is to return a policy that is good on a very large event, like a policy that, that we can guarantee um, its value. In particular, this suggests that we look at the lower bounds uh, from our confidence interval. So for action A, we're going to look at the, we're going to construct the lower bound. You might use your favorite concentration inequality, often Bernstein, uh, whatever it is. You're going to do that for action A. You're going to do that for action B. And you will discover that in this example, um, action B has the higher lower bound. And so you can guarantee that the value of action B is at least as high as its lower bound. The same for action A, action B looks better, and the lower bound looks better. So what you should return is action B because you can certify that the value is fairly high and you're confident about it. Value of uh, the value of B may be sorry, the value of A may be higher, but that may be on you know just with some probability. So there is a chance that you're very wrong if you select uh, 
um, action A. Um, now, what we're going to do is essentially this idea, but more at scale with function approximation and in the sequential setting. But it's really it really boils down to this uh, uh, simple idea that can be appreciated in uh, this simple example. So before I move ahead, is, is there any um, questions on um, this setup, uh, like the goal we're trying to achieve uh, was the sort of uh, attempt to solve the problem? It looks like no, so I'm trying to, I will try to go ahead. Um, starting from this uh, uh, simple, you know, two actions um, decision problem, let's try to generalize. How did we solve that problem? Well, uh, we essentially had two policies, a policy that plays action A and a policy that plays action B. And for each of them, we computed a high, a high probability lower bound. And then we put everything together and we select the policy that has the highest um, uh, high probability lower bound. Let's try to generalize this procedure. Let's suppose that instead of having two policies, we have a bunch of them. So we have a policy class. What are we doing with this policy class? Well, we're trying to optimize some lower bound. And the lower bound is really uh, trying to um, to find the model that is most pessimistic about the value of a policy. So the objective function that we're trying to maximize is a lower bound on the performance of each policy. And this lower bound very abstractly means we want to be um, pessimistic in the face of uncertainty. And so if I have a bunch of action value functions or a bunch of MDPs, I'm going to loop the ones that um, sort of fits the data, is consistent with the data, but I'm gonna find several that are consistent with the data and I'm gonna select uh, the most pessimistic one because we want to be adversarial in the face, we want to be pessimistic in the face of uncertainty. We want to be risk adverse. And this uh, sort of, you know, leads to a natural max mean algorithm uh, um, is kind of a formulation that um, looks very natural to me. If you want to be robust in the face of uncertainty, and you have a bunch of policies, you have a bunch of uh, a, a way to evaluate those policies. It might be a model-based um, function evaluation, or it may be some uh, model-free way to evaluate those policies. Really, you should write down some form of max-mean formulation. And then, of course, a big question is how, how do we actually solve the max-mean formulation algorithmically, which is um, what, what I'm going to talk about uh, um, next. So max mean formulation will be our sort of end goal. Uh, I'm gonna move to actor critic. Actor critic, um, I mean, actor critic algorithms, they have been around for uh, several years now. Um, and um, I would say they naturally are an algorithmic tool that you should consider to solve a problem like this, because again, we are writing a max mean formulation. The maximization is over the policy, and the minimization is over the possible value that each of these policy can take. And so, um, ideally, there is a separation between a maximization over policy that doesn't care about how those policies are evaluated, and a minimization over the value of the policy that doesn't care about what the optimizer is doing. And so this naturally leads to an actor critic type of formulation. Uh, in particular, the critic will try to evaluate the policies. The critic will actually use the data set and for any given policy, it will try to minimize the value function uh, at the very beginning, at, at, the, at the initial state of interest. And um, um, it will give some feedback to the actor the feedback can be in, in form of, you know, the value of the initial state, but it might be something a bit more complicated. It might be like the gradient uh, of the value function. And then the actor is going to uh, use this adversarial information from uh, 
uh, the critic and try to adjust his policy so that the objective function improves. Now, um, this is sort of a fairly uh, general approach. Huh? Can we put this to work by making more concrete choices? Um, the answer is yes. What we focus on here in this talk is um, the class of uh, linear action value function and soft max policies. And for this, we will achieve uh, minimax um, mini rates. So to be more specific, the policy class will be the soft max policy class. Um, the, you know, the sort of usual exponential um, type of um, um, selection, meaning that um, you will compute, uh, um, for, for in every state, you will compute um, the, the, the function, the exponential function in uh, the parentheses. And um, we assume we have some feature extractor phi um, that can be evaluated in every state in action. And there is some theta parameter. This theta parameter um, controls the policy, like you would change the policy by changing the theta parameter. And the way to evaluate those policies, again, is done through um, a linear function class. So we adopt a model three perspective and we say, let's try to evaluate uh, the softmax policies that the actor chooses using linear action value functions. And the features are going to be the same feature that the feature extractor is going to be the same feature extractor that the actor uses. Now, this choice is actually quite delicate um, because there is a notion of compatibility between the action value function class and the policy class, meaning that the, the, the action, um, the, the, the policy class should be producing policies that the critic is able to evaluate. And so the specific choice here is, is quite important. Otherwise, you might start to introduce uh, some form of approximation error. It's fine, you can deal with it, but um, you should just be aware that uh, the, the choice will start to be uh, quite delicate. Now, let's talk about um, the algorithm. Um, the algorithm is, uh, we call it ACL, Pessimistic Act to Critic for uh, Learning Without Exploration. And it has two components. The first component is the critic and the other is the actor. The critic is essentially a variation of the well-known least square policy evaluation algorithm with a pessimistic component that will allow least square policy evaluation to return a, a pessimistic evaluation um, of the actor policy. How does he work? How does he, how does he do that? I'm going to give more details in, in the next slide, but the idea is that instead of just running least square policy evaluation naively to evaluate the policies, it will um, essentially augment it and create um, a second order of comp program. That it sounds a bit complicated, but it's not really complicated. In particular, this program is gonna be a quadratic program. It's a linear, linear objective subject to quadratic constraint. So something that you can solve is a convex problem. Um, you can just invoke any, any really convex solver, uh, any QP solver if you want. And um, it will, it will uh, return a pessimistic evaluation for um, any actor policy, in particular the, the current one that the actor is uh, choosing. And uh, it will ensure that this pessimistic estimate at the initial state. In general, you, you, not, you, you won't be able to obtain pessimistic estimates everywhere in, in the state and action space, simply because your uh, function class doesn't have uh, that capacity. It, it's not powerful enough to be pessimistic throughout the full state and action space. We will have to make a choice, and the choice is that the program should be pessimistic where it matters, uh, which is the initial state where you're actually evaluating the policy. Computational tractability, again, is not a problem. This is a convex pro uh, program. Uh, the, it has very few constraints. And so uh, it's something that you can implement without any issue. Um, 
And um, there is sort of an assumption. Uh, oops. Did I lose? Um, uh, one second. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, screen yeah. share resumes. No. Uh, did you resume? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like I'm having a few issues here, but hopefully it will uh, get us to the end. Um, so there are some assumptions, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, later. But essentially, really, the key assumption is um, we do need least square policy valuation to function. If the basic algorithm, least square policy valuation works, then essentially these algorithm uh, would also work. This assumption is called Bellman closure. But again, think about um, do you trust least square policy valuation? If yes, then uh, this thing is gonna is gonna be a minor variation of that. In terms of actor, what do we do for for the actor? Well, um, for the actor, so essentially, what's happening is something along those lines. Um, the actor is selecting a policy. And uh, this policy is being evaluated by the critic. And then the critic is using whatever information is, is uh, sorry, the actor is using whatever information is given back by the critic, in particular the gradient, and it will change the policy. But crucially, the critic provides adversarial evaluation because it's trying to minimize um, the value of the actor policy. It's like a game, right, max mean. And so you should use some form of uh, um, online learning algorithm, some algorithm that is appropriate uh, whenever the objective function is adversarial. For example, mirror descent. So what we do use here is some variation of mirror descent. It's not straight mirror descent applied uh, to the objective function. It's something a bit different. It's called natural policy gradient, but it has a strong connection with mirror descent. And this is really the right tool to use because, um, again, the critic is sort of fighting the actor, is trying to evaluate uh, the policies um, selected by the actor in an adversarial fashion. Um, and so you should use some optimizer that is uh, quite robust for uh for the uh, online from the online learning uh, literature like online convex optimization um and so you should use something like mirror descent um now let me pause for questions are there sort of any question on these big schematics uh, of, of the algorithm if not i'm gonna go ahead and and try to give more detail about how the critic looks like, which is sort of um, the important part if you want. And I'm gonna give some details about the actor. Um, but those details, in a sense, they are a bit more technical. Um, I would say this is kind of the important part. Uh, this, is, this slide is summarizing uh, the full algorithm. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Um, the critic. So let's go into more detail about the critic. The critic is essentially a variation of the least square policy evaluation algorithm. I think pretty much, you know, most of you should 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 probably be familiar with it because it's one of the standard algorithms uh, that we use in in reinforcement learning. Um, and um, if you want, uh, um, let's try to summarize least square policy evaluation of how it works. Suppose you have uh, some edge stage problem, like a finite horizon problem. What least square policy evaluation would do, it would try to um, create some empirical Bellman backup operator and then project 
the solution back to the space of Q function that you can represent. And we can think about this process as happening in, uh, <clears throat> in like in directly in the parameter space. Let's say um, WH plus one is the parameter associated with the next step um, action value function. What's really happening is that least square policy evaluation applies some form of Bayman operator and then a projection operator back into the parameter space and it will produce a new uh, parameter WH. And this continues uh, up to the initial time step. So we're looking at a finite horizon problem here. Now, this is what, you know, the way you would actually sort of implement using, using the data set. But let's take a look at what actually happens in, in, in the real world. So there is some true Bayman operator um, that is being applied to um, the critic parameter uh, WH plus one. And this will create, uh, after the reprojection, a new parameter. But then there is some noise um, due to the, um, to the data set that will uh, make so that we do not just compute uh, the exact Bayman update, but this update is going to be corrupted by the noise. And so it is as if least square policy evaluation is doing an update in parameter space with a true Bellman operator, but with some noise, noise eta, the, the red one, which we do not know. Like we do not know exactly the direction of the noise. If you knew it, we would be able to um, compute the exact Bellman uh, backup. But what we can do is to bound uh, the norm of the noise. Now, the norm is kind of a, if you want a complex object, it's going to be a norm in, in a, like a specific type of norm, not just a two norm. Um, but the important part is that we can quantify the size of the perturbation due to the noise. We do not know in what direction it is pushing the parameter, but we do know the magnitude of it. Now, the idea is that uh, we will introduce perturbation to least square policy evaluation, perturbation directly in the parameter space. And so what's really happening in the real world is that it is as if this perturbed least square policy evaluation is applying the exact by an operator, and there is some noise that is affecting um, the calculation, and we are also adding some perturbation. Now, the perturbation is going to be key because by setting the perturbation appropriately, we will extract a pessimistic evaluation at the initial state. How do we do that? Well, we do it as follows. Um, we cast the solution of least square policy evaluation as an optimization program, which will try to minimize the value function at the very beginning so the, the objective here, uh, Q1, W, etc., is really the, the value function of a certain policy, a policy pi. And this value function depends on the critic parameter, the, the, the parameter W, that is being computed by least square policy evaluation. What we will do is to say, hey, W has to follow um, the, the least square policy evaluation equation. And, and we will put that as constraint. So every constraint, um, you know, the, the, the line here such that WH equal blah, 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 projection of with a perturbation, that really means we want our solution to comply with what the square policy evaluation would give us plus some perturbation. Now, this perturbation is going to be the variable that we optimize over. Uh, why do we want to do that? Well, because we want to uh, um, modify uh, this psi parameter, this perturbation, so that we are pessimistic at the initial state to return a pessimistic estimate. And let's take a look at what happens again in the real world. Uh, just by you know substituting the equation above, um, what's really happening is that uh, we are essentially applying the correct Bayman operator with some noise and some perturbation. Now, if the perturbation, if we could set the perturbation equal 
to minus the noise, we would obtain precisely the, the value function of the policy under consideration at the initial state. Unfortunately, the noise is not known, but we do know the norm of the noise. And so we, we can set the norm of the perturbation to be equal to the norm of the noise. And so essentially setting psi equal to minus the noise is a feasible solution, which means our algorithm would be at least as pessimistic as the correct value function. So it will indeed return um, a solution um, which is pessimistic at the initial state. Of course, the norm of psi shouldn't be too large because you don't want to be overly conservative. But again, the norm of the noise that determines the norm of the perturbation is something that we can compute. We, we don't need uh, uh, any problem knowledge. It's something that we can compute analytically. And so at the end of the day, this will return some pessimistic estimate at the initial state. And this value function is going to be linear. It's going to stay in the prescribed uh, function class. When is this algorithm working? It's essentially working whenever least square policy valuation works, because what we're really doing is least square policy valuation with some perturbation to its solution. Now, for the actor, um, well, I do not know if there is any, any uh, question for, for the critic, uh, but if not, I'm going to uh, move to the actor real quick. Um, I think the actor is sort of perhaps less um, important than, than the critic. The critic is kind of really the core of the algorithm. Um, the actor, we make a specific choice here, but it's not the only one possible. Um, we use some variation of mirror descent, which is very connected to the natural policy gradient uh, that was introduced um, perhaps uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and um, so the, the way this would work is sort of as follows. Um, Suppose uh, that I can, in every state, solve a problem that is a problem like learning from experts, in which I'm given a Q function and I have a policy that I can choose freely, a distribution of a function that I can choose freely in every, in every state. Well, if I want to solve this with um, a mirror descent type of algorithm in every state, again, one, one mirror descent instantiation for every state, well, that would lead uh, with KL divergence to um, the exponential update rule. Um, and if you if you were able to do this in every state, uh, then essentially you would solve the maximum uh, prob problem um, as long as the Q function is the actual uh, Q function given by the critic. So as long as this Q is the, the one given by the critic, you would actually be able to solve them. Uh, the maximum program exactly. The problem is that this would be too expensive because uh, solving a mirror descent problem in every state is too much if the state space is very large. But thankfully, there's a lot of structure into this problem. And this is really um, pertaining the, fun the functional spaces that we use. And the key idea is um, it really goes back to the notion of compatible function approximation uh, from uh, Sham 2011. Um, the idea is that the critic is really able to evaluate the, the policies chosen by the actor. And if you do an update rule using exponential gradients in every state, then you would still obtain a policy that belongs to the softmax policy class. So long story short, uh, while this exponential policy update rule is sort of the right thing to do, in, in, in every state. And if you do this, you will actually solve the maximum program. It turns out that we are lucky because uh, we don't actually need to solve, uh, to apply mirror descent in every state, but instead we can just uh, uh, do some uh, quick um, uh, update directly in the critic parameter. And this update is done uh, um, using the vector W, um, identified by the critic with some learning rate eta. And this vector is just added to whatever the current critic parameter, whatever whatever it is the, the current um, parameter for the actor policy. So at the end of the day, what's happening is that um, 
I have a sequence of policies that have been generated by the actor. And there is a very simple update rule that I do globally, that we do globally. Uh, and this is just a simple vector of addition. So very cheap to implement. And what this will do is it will essentially apply this um, exponential gradient rule in every state. This is something implicit, um, but it's quite important because it basically removes um, all the computational burden, uh, since you just need to do a simple vector of addition in every step. So at the end of the day, what is really happening here is the following. Um, again, the actor is proposing a bunch of policies and the critic is giving back feedback in terms of this W parameter. This is connected to the gradient. And at the end of the day, um, you will approach the solution of the max mean um, program. Um, okay, unless there is any intermediate question, I'm gonna jump to the main result. Um, we can, I mean, um, th there are some assumptions that you need to make in every work in, in the reinforcement learning. Um, I wouldn't like to go into too much detail about uh, the type of assumptions. Uh, what I want to highlight is that the assumption that we make about um, the, uh, the action value function are those that enable the least square policy valuation algorithm to function. So if the least square policy valuation algorithm functions, then essentially those assumptions are satisfied and you can, uh, you can essentially use this work. Otherwise, you may need to change the critic. Um, but, but that's essentially the assumption uh, that we have in the work. We call it restricted closeness. It's related to a bunch of other things that people have been talking about uh, in, in the literature. But at the end of the day, is really what enables least square policy evaluation, the vanilla version, to function properly. Um, well, on to the main result. Um, so before we present it, there is a function that we need to define, and, and we call it uncertainty function. The uncertainty function, it, it does uh, what the name suggests. It quantifies the uncertainty about any policy. So for any policy, I can sort of express the uncertainty of the algorithm using an expression that is essentially a sum over single step uncertainties. And uh, what's contained in, in this summation is, uh, well, you know, square root of the dimension of, of the feature extractor, that the, the more high dimensional the problem is, the more uncertain I'm gonna be, right? Uh, metric entropy is gonna increase. It is something that decreases with the number of samples. As I collect more samples, it's gonna go down with the standard rate, one divided by square root of n. And inside the normal, I have the, um, average feature extractor along uh, the trajectory of the policy that I am evaluating. And this uh, expected feature extractor is evaluated in the, even, in, in the inverse covariance matrix. So what this really means is um, really the quantity of interest is how is the data set aligned with what the target policy um, visits, but in feature space, meaning that the distribution for uh, the distribution of the state and action of the target policy might be quite different from uh, the one of the behavioral policy, the one that generates the data set. This is still fine as long as um, the data set sort of covers the target policy in feature space, so in the space of the feature extractor. In particular, this uncertainty is going to be small if um, essentially the expected feature of the target policy, uh, the quantity inside the norm, is well aligned with uh, uh, the covariance matrix. So if it is along you know, one of the principal directions and you have enough samples, then the uncertainty function is going to be smaller. You can interpret this as a concentrability coefficient um and um yeah so basically you know it says 
how the information that you acquire on policy, how do they transfer of policy? Now for this work, um, yeah, let's forget about the comparison with Jean and, and other people. Um, like the, one of the main results of the work is a bound on the suboptimality gap. Uh, v, hat, uh, v hat star is the policy returned by the algorithm. And what we want is a high probability bound compared to an optimal controller, compared to the best policy uh, uh, whose value is D star. And what we find is that this uncertainty function that is defined above, evaluated at the optimal policy, really plays a critical role because it both highlights uh, the upper bound. So the algorithm would find a policy that depends on the uncertainty that you have about the optimal policy only. And also this is a lower bound, meaning that you really cannot do better than this from a statistical point of view. This is for linear action value function. Now, um, a natural question could be, um, what happens if I do not cover the optimal policy? Well, it depends what you cover in that case. Do, do you cover any policy that is reasonably good? If so, the algorithm is going to return the best it can do with the available data. Uh, I think this extension is best explained uh, with a diagram. The, the actor is going to contain infinite policies, right? You know, it's, it's a soft max policy class, but let's focus on a few of them. And let's suppose, uh, uh, you know, let's take a look at, at some of them. Um, perhaps uh, in, in an example like this, uh, you're very uncertain about the optimal policy. So the optimal policy, you do not know which one is the optimal policy, but um, if, if you do, some sort of analysis of the algorithm, you might find that perhaps your data set is not really informative about the value of the optimal policy. That is still fine because um, there might be another policy in, in the policy class, huh, which has a very high uh, value that you're confident about. So the first policy is the optimal one, uh, perhaps if you just do maximum likelihood and you take the best policy, the fourth one uh, might be better. You do not know the value of the optimal policy. You do not know which one the optimal policy is, but you, you do know that the second policy, the one that they call by head star, is very good because the lower bound is, is very high. So it might be that there is a policy that is better than this, like the first one or the fourth one might be better, but you're also very unsure about their values. Nonetheless, you would return the, the second policy um, and its value is guaranteed to be indeed still very close to the, uh, the one of the optimal policy. And so the type of guarantees that we have is that the policy that the algorithm returns they, they strike some balance between uh, how suboptimal uh, the comparator can be and how uncertain you are about the comparator. And so we can compete with sort of, you know, old policies in, in the prescribed policy class simultaneously and find the one that uh, we are more, uh, you know, the most confident about, uh, the one with the highest lower bound. And this really follows from, from the analysis um, of the algorithm. Guarantees like these uh, um, are essentially guarantees uh, that certify that the algorithm is doing the best it can with the available data set. Now, um, I think with this, I uh, essentially, um, I'm you know, going towards the end, meaning that let's take a step back and, and see uh, what we have seen today. Uh, well, the maximum formulation is really kind of the way you should think about um, an offline reinforcement learning problem if you want to be risk adverse. And natural tools are online learning for solving the maximization program because you're really solving an adversarial program and some form of critic to solve the minimization program. In this case, we did a least square policy evaluation with the pessimistic um, uh, change, but you may think about changing 
the critic, uh, if you have a different application, it could be something more related to important something. But importantly, I think the basic schematics is, is quite important, this distinction between max mean and actor critic. And in our case, we use compatible function approximation. We really leverage that to achieve minimax rates. Uh, and of course, there are you know, a bunch of open questions. Can, we, can you move uh, beyond uh, these simple linear classes with probable guarantees, for example, uh, kernels, you know, non-parametric models, or possibly non-linear models? And of course, uh, an empirical evalu evaluation uh, is also quite important. We haven't done that yet, but uh, we plan to do so. And yeah, with this, I conclude, uh, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Andrea, uh, for the talk. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so now I think I, we can go into uh, uh, the discussion session. Uh, Xiaochen, you wanna uh, take over? Uh, yeah, uh, what an uh, amazing sorry. talk, Andrea. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, for your talk. And uh, so I guess while we uh, wait to receive questions, I'm actually um, very excited to ask uh, you a few. Um, so while I was uh, listening to your talk, I was trying to better understand the role uh, the bound on the perturbations plays in the algorithms, because um, it seems to me that uh, this uh, perturbation, uh, you call it eta, or uh, this perturbation is actually the key to the trade-off of uncertainty and optimality. Uh, for example, it looks like a larger, uh, yeah, the alpha here, I guess, uh, larger alpha allows the perturbation to happen in a larger region, uh, but also uh, increases uh, uncertainty, uncertainty error. So yeah, I would like to uh, hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so the, the, indeed, you're asking a, a very good question. So this alpha parameter is something that we can essentially compute them. And it really comes out um, of least square regression. And we can compute this alpha parameter that bounds the noise. This calculation, we can do it in the linear setting, but it's not easy to do if you, if you have other types of function approximation. Like if you give me a black box type of function approximation and you want to try to emulate what's happening here, things get a bit more complicated. But in the linear setting, again, the bound on the noise, uh, on, the, on the noise perturbation, um, like the statistical error is something that we can compute in closed form. And then we can set it um, for XI um, um, in, you know, in, in a very analytical way. Now, as you're saying, there is a trade-off because uh, you know, it also depends on how much stochasticity you have in the environment. For example, if you have some problem that comes from robotic, and you know there is perhaps very little stochasticity in the transitions and in the rewards then that would affect the value of alpha now you might not be super like you might not know exactly what the value should be uh, and of course then there is an, inter an interesting trade-off meaning that if alpha is too small then you are at risk of not being able to provide guarantees meaning that you know, the smaller, think about setting alpha to zero. If you set alpha to zero, this algorithm is essentially, actually it is equivalent to um, least square policy evaluation. And so you will not do any pessimistic perturbation, meaning that you take, you take a chance. Perhaps there is a policy that least square policy evaluation tells you is very good, but it might be very good just because you have some weird statistical fluctuation in the data set. So if alpha is too small in, in the algorithm, you will not be able to satisfy, like you will not be able to return a good policy with confidence. If it is too large, then it's gonna be too conservative. And so it's gonna give you a policy that is very close, uh, for example, to the one that generated the data set. Think about having a behavioral policy. And if alpha is very, very large, well, you still know the value 
of the policy that generated the data set very well because you have a lot of samples from it. And so you won't penalize it that much, but you will penalize policies that are quite different from it. And so the algorithm tend to stay closer uh, to the policy that generated the data. So that's kind of the trade-off. Got it, awesome. So, uh, so I guess uh, my understanding is that it's, uh, it's like a, mm, represent a spectrum of a trade-off between uncertainty and optimality. But you just mentioned we can, uh, uh, for some uh, particular cases, like in a linear case, we, uh, cases, we can actually have a close form of this, uh, uh, this parameters. I was wondering how much, how restrict our, uh, you know, final results actually rely on this closed form. And, uh, and for this particular value of alpha, what kind of trade-off does we, do we make uh, regarding that, that particular closed form? So, so the question is like, how, how does the result depend on, on alpha? Um, how, yeah, like, uh, so the alpha is like a trade-off between uncertainty and optimality. Uh, the too small alpha, it will, we basically, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, back to the whole example you just, you gave it at the start of the talk uh we uh, if our is too small we have we might have the action a right so it's optimal but with the uh, worse lower bound something like that and uh, you you and then you talk about we can have a closed form uh equation for this but uh, for for alpha in some uh in some particular cases like in the linear cases yes i was wondering like this particular closed form what kind of trade-off does it stand for like uh, it's what kind of trade trade off does it make uh, so, regarding uncertainty and optimality? So in a, in a sense, uh, there is not really a, a trade off if you know what the, the correct value of alpha should be. So if you can, like we do have an analytical expression in the linear setting, meaning that in that case, you don't really need to make that much of a trade off because like it's, it's quite, like you can compute what the value of alpha should be. The question would be if you want to extend this algorithm to a setting that you know goes beyond linear and where you might not be able to do uh, calculation analytically, then there is indeed a trade-off and it's the one you're suggesting. So a value too small, then the algorithm would not essentially use pessimism effectively. And so there is a risk that it would try to sort of overfit to the data set. Like, you know, there is some maximization bias in, in the data set. And maybe there is a policy where we just have, you know, a few samples and the algorithm without pessimism, it might be that one of those policies that they have few samples about is gonna appear very, you know, very high in value. The algorithm might try to jump on that, but it might be very suboptimal. And so a value smaller for alpha, um, allows you to be more aggressive, but you're also taking some substantial risk because you don't really know if the policy you're returning is any good. Um, whereas if you expand it, again, you, 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 you are very conservative. Um, and so you might rule out, you know, controllers that still look very good, policies that still look very good, uh, but you will return a policy that you're very confident about this value. Got it, thanks. I'm not sure if this uh, addresses your question, but. Uh, oh yeah, 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 I think uh, it does. Yeah, thanks. Actually, in the, uh, I have a follow-up question, like in a, maybe in a broader sense. Uh, so like a popular belief in offline RL, is that uh, pessimism is an effective mechanism for, uh, uh, for example, mitigating the negative consequences of uh, due to lack of data coverage. Yeah, uh, exactly. data coverage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, here in this results, uh, we can see that the degree of a pessimism, which is the uh, in the main results, uh, which is the alpha or the bound on the perturbation, uh, perturbation vector uh, and the, the data coverage uh, seems to be connected in the uncertainty arrow bound. 
uh, yeah, that the the one you're showing here. I was wondering if you could uh, share your thoughts on um, what is the right kind of uh, pessimism for offline RL uh, in general. What do you uh -huh. think? So uh, this is, it looks to me, is a more open-ended question. <laughs> so um, it depends a bit on how much you trust your, your models. Um, le let me make something, you know, very, very simple as an example. Um, a work like this is working with least square policy valuation, which is a value-based method to evaluate policies. Now, you would use something like this, uh, or, you know, on top of using pessimism, you would use an algorithm like this, uh, if you believe uh, it will return a good solution for uh, the off-policy evaluation problem. Sometime uh, there are other issues like approximation error, right? Because you have a data set and naturally you tend to extrapolate what you see here to predict another problem, another policy. We do know that this is a policy. Sorry, we do know that the extrapolation is a problem in, in, in the reinforcement learning. And so you might say, I want to use also another critic because you know a different type of critic, like something that constrains the policy to be closer to the one that generated the data. And this is something that people do a lot in practice, uh, modern value-based methods, uh, as far as they know, they try to constrain the policy to really be close to the, to the policy that generated the data. And they operate directly on the policy and not on the value function. Um, and this is because you might not trust a value-based method to do of policy evaluation, because you have this distribution shift type of problem. So pessimism is not the only thing that's, um, important is also how much you think your model is, is, is correct. Like how, how does, for example, approximation error and the extrapolation problem enters um, into, into the problem? Because pessimism in the way we use it here and the way other people use it, it really addresses the, the statistical component. So it's really trying to say, I have some statistical um, you know, uncertainty in my data set, but it doesn't necessarily, like it might not address the problem of model misspecification. Um, and, and so for that, you may really need to change the underlying algorithm. So the right form of pessimism, you know, it can take many different ways. Um, here we have something quite specific for, for the linear setting. But if you want, again, you can ask the question more, more, more broadly, like, do I trust the, my, my, my algorithm? Like, do I trust the least square policy evaluation subroutine? Because if not, then pessimism might take a different form. It might take some form of constraints that they put on my policy in terms of its divergence from uh, the one that generated the data. Does this roughly uh, answer your questions or? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting. I mean, it's, uh, it's supposed to be an open-ended question. So I, I just wanna hear the, a broader take uh, from you, I think. Uh, so yeah, it's very, so, there are definitely different approaches out there in the literature. Um, Dr. Zenit, I have a question. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, how do you have you have you um empirically compared um your approach um with um other uh, model based um offline uh, approaches such as uh, uh Mopo and uh, Moral? We haven't done that yet. We haven't done that, right? Um, th those are quite different, though, right? So right, they, they they introduce pessimism um, into their um, their models directly. So uh, I definitely appreciate um, the uh, the simplicity um, of uh, of your approach, where you uh, directly add um, pessimism into uh, your uh, your value functions. So I was yeah, I was, I was just really curious um, if no, we, we haven't done that yet. Um, I think we plan on doing it um, perhaps this summer. We're actually still working on on uh, this area of offline RL, uh, and 
you know, with, with some other algorithms. We definitely want to do some evaluation. My guess, my, my guess is that, um, okay, so this also goes back to uh, the prior question about alpha, like in practice, this parameter, you know, bound on the norm is something that uh, for a practical problem, you would almost always need to choose it, uh, you know, in, in a way that's different from what the theory recommends because theory is somehow still connected to, uh, you know, this worst case type of scenario, but, you know, you might have, for example, again, low stochasticity in the environment. And so you would introduce some multiplier that um, shrinks this alpha. And I guess there are going to be cases in which uh, model-based, uh, uh, like some of these other works, uh, you know, they, they perform better and some other in which uh, this one performs better. Um, and this is not really connected to the statistical component. Uh, it's perhaps more, more connected to what assumptions are we making about those algorithms? Because again, model three and model based, they differ widely in terms of um, the assumption that they implicitly make uh, about uh, a market decision process. Generally, model three is seen as, as more difficult, meaning that it can cause more issues um, simply because you're making less assumption about the structure of the MDP and with a single, even just with a single action value function, you can, um, you can represent a variety of MDPs uh, that have the same action value function. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, empirical evaluation is something that uh, we certainly want to do uh, at one point. Right, right. And um, also, I think just um, even even just theoretically, I think uh, your, your approach already um, outlines a, uh, a quite natural extension to, um, to, to an off policy evaluation with, with your, um, right, with, with your pessimism. Yeah, yeah. So off policy evaluation is kind of done um, implicitly here, right? Right. Because... That's what I feel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, the critic is precisely doing that. And, you know, it's returning pessimistic evaluation, but you may also say, I, I want really confidence intervals and the, there's a minor change you need to make instead of solving mean, you solve a max problem and it's still no problem from a computational standpoint and it will give you confidence intervals. So yes, as, as part of this policy optimization, um, like a problem that we have to solve is the off policy evaluation problem. Maybe uh, uh, let's take one last question uh, if there's any. Um, actually, uh, yeah, Andrea, maybe. Um, oh, I, I, I was just sorry <laughs> about to ask Andrea. Um, um, is there any like uh, convergence rate um, uh, results that, that you can talk about uh, for this iterative algorithm? Um, convergence rate with respect to the samples or with respect to the number of iterations? Uh, iterations, yeah. So it's one divided by square root of k, which is sort of where k is the number of iterations. And um, is, okay. that's kind of the standard one for um, online learning, right? If you have a, an online learning problem uh, without a, a strong convexity, then that's kind of the standard rate you get out of mirror descent. Um, and yeah, there shouldn't be the much of a concern because like you know iteration is something that you can crank up without um, having more samples like it doesn't you don't need more samples to do more iterations right and it basically affects the computational complexity only yeah yeah um and yeah um, so since you uh solve a qp um uh, yeah, yeah. iteration so um i was uh, just wondering so basically yeah, yeah. the standard result would apply in this case yeah. yes okay Again, there you can speed it up. So 
there is an interesting choice that is not even in, in, in the paper, it's, it's not in, in the theories, it's not something we examine. But uh, so essentially, you, you can uh, obtain the results of this paper, even if the algorithm moves faster, like you can get like a one divided by K rate instead of square root of K, but there are some subtle issues if you implement it in, in practice, because if there is no misspecification, then it's good. You can use a faster learning rate, but if there is misspecification, you will lose some of the benefits of mirror descent. Again, this is not in the theory of the paper, but you can do sort of a refined analysis. And it's really the same reason for why um, we prefer to move slowly in, in, in online array. We don't want to do large distribution uh, changes. We want to use sort of small learning rates. Something similar applies here. You become more robust to model misspecification. So this rate, you know, you can potentially go faster than, than one divided by square root of K, but you shouldn't really do that because this is going to be more robust to uh, possible misspecification. Great. Um, I think uh, for the interest of time, um, let's uh, close this session here. Uh, let's thanks again, uh, Andrea and Xiao Chen. Uh, Thank you all. For participating in this session. Um, I, I really uh, learned a lot. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for uh, coming today. Um, so we'll see you guys uh, for the next session. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.